We are jumping back. Um, actually, atomic structure and historical overview. Guess where we're going to start? Grandpa Democritus. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I didn't bring them with me. <laughs> Again, I've, I'm looking at it as a mercy. I want to keep you motivated, you know? <laughs> I'm not hiding it from you. I just kind of, I've already moved on to module three. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, actually, I was going to enter those grades today for that exam. Um, I haven't copied the originals. I will. I'll get them back to you today. But I need to figure out what class that should be in because remember, when I give it back to you, it's the raw score. Okay? The raw score's on it. And that's not what's going into I now. But it'll give you an idea out of 100 based upon the publisher what you would have scored. Start all over again. Atomic structure, historical overview. We're going back to Democritus. Remind me, what did Democritus say? What was Democritus' contribution that we've talked about thus far? Remember, we're back in the time when science and philosophy were kind of the same thing, and Democritus made one of these big statements. He spoke out in opposition to another great philosopher, right? What was Democritus? Yes, ma'am. Right. Democritus was the one that forwarded the discontinuous theory of matter, and he was kind of a lesser player in the philosophical realm, and so his ideas didn't carry as much weight. But Democritus said that, you know, atoms of different elements were made up of different shapes and they fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. That was basically his idea. And it came from, if you remember, Democritus's concept as he walked towards a beach and he was considering the continuous theory of matter and said, well, there's beach. There's what we would call the element of beach. But as he got closer, he realized, hey, what looks like beach is actually made up of little particles of sand. And you know what? The particles of sand are different. They only look to be like one continuous piece of matter because from a distance, they look that way. And as he considered matter, the things that make up everything, he said, you know what? The deal is that we can't see how small these pieces are. From the distance we're looking at them, they look continuous, but they're really not. They're actually pieces. And the way he came up with the idea how things held together was based upon their shape. Some of them were based upon features like they, they hypothesized that certain elements had like hooks, like Velcro, and that atoms hung together because of their shape. See here, for example, water. If you conceive of water as being nice, smooth, round orbs, then you can see how it would flow, move across each other real easily, like a liquid in your hands. Or iron, speculated, had really spiky points on it. So water can't fl or excuse me, iron can't flow because of the shape of the atom, the smallest piece. And that was kind of the concept that was at play from Democritus was about 2,400 years ago. This basic idea of the atom remained in existence until the 1800s. Okay, so we're only what we understand about matter and atoms and how we conceptualize the atom today is really only developed over the last couple hundred years, and for thousands of years before that, this kind of thinking about matter was prevalent. That's why if you ever study medieval chemistry, alchemy, believing that if you mix a certain things together in the right proportions, they'll create gold. And so people were out to make their fortunes by figuring out how to take this much chicken dung and this much straw and combine it together to make gold. Because they didn't see gold as a fundamental element, they saw gold more like a mixture. Okay, Now they didn't even use those terms. They just wanted to take something and turn it into something else. So they were looking for the perfect recipe to make gold. All kinds of weird combinations. So Democritus and this thinking of atoms as pieces that have shapes and by character of their shapes, by nature of their shapes, they described how they react and interact with one another. It wasn't until the 1800s when this gentleman named William Crook came along. And we're gonna talk a little bit now about the Crook's tube. Um, this is going to be prevalent on several slides right now, just to get familiar with what we're talking about in terms of the Crookes tube. The Crookes tube later became known as a cathode ray tube, CRT. It's the basis for a lot of instrument screens, old televisions. You know the televisions before your time that were deep? Like when I had to carry a TV when I was a kid, it was like two people because it was so deep and it had to sit way far away from the wall before flat screen technology. It's because 
the primary way of making the picture was using a cathode ray, using a tube like this. And if you ever looked at the front of them, front of those TVs, there's a little bit of a bend to it. And that little bit of a bend compensates for the radius of the cathode rays that's shooting to the front. And we'll, we could get into more detail later, but for right now, cathode ray tubes. It has two, or has a tube itself, which is full of a gas, has a battery that connects to one end with the negative supply, the negative charge to the cathode, that idea cat, cathode, that'll be important later on. We talk about cat ions, they're the negative ions. And then the positive terminal goes to a point in the middle of the tube, the anode, later on anions, and how those are positive ions. So the term cathode and anode were part of the terminology at this time relating to negative and positive. So what Crook did is he took a cathode ray tube, he filled it with gas, and he connected a battery to it. This tube was known as a Crook's tube, because give him some credit, right? He came up with this idea. I'm going to take a tube, I'm going to fill it with gas, I'm going to hook a battery, a negative and a positive end to it, and I'll see what happened. And what happened? When there was a current, in other words, when the connection was made, he noticed that there was a greenish yellow glow that appeared inside the tube. So he connects the battery, greenish glow. He disconnects the battery, the glow stops. Now, junior scientists, do you agree that for some reason, adding electrical current was creating the glow? That's, that's his basic point, right? Well, there's something about adding this current, electrical current, and for some reason, there is this greenish tint or this greenish glow that occurs. So he concluded that there were particles hitting the end of the tube, causing it to glow. Okay. Not trying to explain exactly what the particles are yet. He just said, when I connect the battery, it glows. When I disconnect the battery, it stops. It glows, but it primarily glows at the end of the tube. There must be something hitting it, something shining on it, particles moving in that direction in order to make it glow. And since the particles seem to be coming from the cathode, they move from this negative point, moving in this direction. Since they came from the cathode, he called them cathode rays. Now, because they called cathode rays, then the Crookes tube became known as a cathode ray tube. Okay? So, it's, it's a Crookes tube where he discovered cathodes. Cathodes renamed the tube as a cathode ray tube because it appeared like whatever particles were moving and casting this light or casting this glow, they were coming from the cathode toward the anode. And he can also took it one step further and said, this glow that's happening at the end of the tube is actually particles because if I put something in the middle, that little Maltese cross there, that's what he used. If I put something in the way of the cathode particles, the cathode rays, they get blocked. And they actually form a shadow at the end of the tube. So kind of like doing hand puppets, you know? There's a light on, I put my hand up there, do the hand puppet. Why isn't the hand puppet, it's a hairy duck, okay? Why, isn't, why is the light not hitting where my hand is? Because my hand is blocking it. You know, if the screen was still lit, if I could not cast a shadow, you would say particles are still hitting it somehow. Or maybe it's not particles, maybe there's another explanation. But he said, hey, because I can form a shadow, I'm blocking something. The something I'm blocking must be the cathodes, cathode rays. And later on, those cathode rays were renamed electrons. Okay, So I do have embedded in this thing a couple of videos and occasionally they work and occasionally they don't. Let's see what happens if I try to play the video here. And I have, think it has to do with the version of PowerPoint that's on this computer. Uh, too bad, huh? I'll go back and play the video for you at the end. But basically what it shows is just turning on the switch and see, seeing the end of the tube light up, fluoresce green, and with the Maltese cross in the way, blocking, make, casting that shadow. So it just basically demonstrated what I just spoke about. 
About 20 years later or so, J.J. Thompson comes along and he goes back to Crook's experiment. And what he did basically demonstrated that Dalton's assumption about the atom was wrong, that the atom is divisible. Now, when we spoke about Dalton in here, we said, you know, he says they're not divisible. We all know they are because nuclear explosion, like nuclear fission, right, breaking up the atom. Yeah, that's pretty dramatic. The discovery that the atom could be broken didn't happen with a nuclear reaction. It happened with these cathodes, these electrons flying apart. Because if the atom is indivisible, we could not create a subatomic particle, which we could do. Here's basically the thinking. It said, no matter what gas was used. In other words, he went through and put multiple various kinds of gases in the Crookes tube. And every time he did this experiment, the same cathode, or the same later known as electrons, electrons were emitted. It didn't matter what element was used. Every time he put an element in the cathode ray tube, cathodes, later known as electrons, were able to be separated out of the gas, the element. And they were all identical. That meant that there was identical component of every atom that could be separated out of every atom. And it had to come from that atom. Therefore, the atom is in some way divisible. In some way, the atom can be broken apart. That's all he showed by showing that he could get the identical particle regardless of the gas that was used in the experiment. So the next step, what he did, is to, he determined that those rays, those cathode rays, aka electrons, responded to magnetic and electrical fields. Here's what he did. If you take the cathode ray tube up there and just kind of visualize it as a straight tube with a negative end and a positive end, and this is filled with gas in the middle, okay? What Thompson was able to show was that as this glow was happening, as electrons were passing from the cathode to the anode and causing this thing to glow, that if he brought a magnet or electronic field near it, that he could bend the rays. And he could bend the rays towards a positive. So the rays were coming out and they were bending towards the positive, or you can think of it as bending away from the negative. All right. So cathode rays, electrons, whatever they are, they're particles that make up every element, and they have a charge which bends toward positive and away from negative. This was the second half of that neat little video. And what they do is, here's the Crookes tube, and they're shining this cathode ray. It's coming up this way. It's causing the shadow in front of the Maltese cross, so we know the particles are hitting. And then a, then a magnet is used to come up here, and as it's brought near, you can see it bending, moving back and forth due to the magnetic influence. And so it's bending away from the negative and bending toward the positive. Now. That historical overview kind of sets us up for this brief discussion on electrical charges. Because the thinking of electrical charge then goes back to this experiment by Thomson to explain what he saw. So here's the basic idea. There are two types of charges, positive and negative. Okay? If you read in the book, you recognize that not only is the idea of positive and negative charges difficult to explain, but scientists still struggle over what electricity is. Electricity is something that we use and we think we've got answers for, but it's not perfectly explainable. Okay? So there's a basic level of assumptions we have to have. Some people speculate that charge is due to the rotation of electrons and things like that. We're, we're not going to get into that kind of level for this class. For here, we're just going to accept that there are two types of charges, positive and negative. Whatever that is, positive and negative. Which way does electricity flow? There was a large debate when in the United States, for example. I think it was Franklin that said that electricity flowed from positive to negative, and the other said it went from negative to positive, because we, you know, until we had diodes, it really didn't matter what direction it was flowing in. 
It just was flowing. For, the, for where we're at right now, we're just going to say, okay, there are two types of charges, positive and negative. And nobody's going to be asked to explain why they exist. They just do. We good with that? Positive, negative charges. Two responses that we have. The first one is that like charges repel each other. Now here on the right hand side, it's shown a repulsion of two negatives. But it's equally true that two positives will repel each other. Okay? So like charges repel each other. And opposite charges attract each other. So a positive and negative will attract each other. Two positives will repel each other. Two negatives will repel each other. A positive and a negative will attract each other. Any questions on that very simple basic overview? OK? All right, so next thing. Most things in the world are electrically neutral. Their charge is a net zero or net neutral. Now here net is not like internet. Net here is the difference between positive and negative. But the fact that things are neutral does not mean that they don't have charges. As a matter of fact, they have positive charges, but they also simultaneously have negative charges. And the net charge is the difference between the positive and the negative. So if I were to say that I am neutrally charged, me as a person, I'm neutrally charged, but I have 10,000 positive charges on me, I must also have 10,000 negative charges to balance it out. Net neutral does not mean you don't have any charges. It means that the positives and the negatives are in equilibrium. They're balancing each other out. OK? So if you conceptualize charges like a scale and little weights, you know what? It doesn't matter how many positives you have as long as you have the same number of negatives. And if the positives equal the negatives, your net charge is 0. As soon as you have an inequality, as soon as you have more than one than the other, then you take on a net charge. So if I have five negative and six positive, I'm positively charged. I'm a positive one. Why? Because my negatives are outnumbered by my positives by one charge. OK? So if you were asked a question, the fact that you pick up a tennis ball and you know the tennis ball has a zero net charge, therefore the tennis ball has no charge on it, right? No. It means it's po equally positive and negative. If it has a plus one charge, it's got one extra positive. It's got a plus two charge, it's got two extra positives in that way. Okay. So going back now, using that for atomic structure, Crook said this. Or excuse me, Thompson said this, looking at Crook's tube. He said, whenever I put the gas in there, the gas is neutral. But the fact that the gas is neutral does not mean that it has no charges in it. It means that if it has charges in it, they must be balanced. And when I put the current through there, negative particles were removed from the element. How do I know? Because it, the particles that were coming out were bending toward the positive and away from the negative. Therefore, since opposites attract, the negative was attracted to the positive and repelled by the other negative. So Thompson's able to say, OK, whatever is coming out of the element, it is a component that's common to every element, and it is negatively charged. So I'm able to separate out a chunk of negative from every element using this process, from the gases that he used. So an equal number of positive <coughs> particles must have been present in the gas when he started. So he puts an element in the tube. It has a net neutral charge, but that doesn't mean it has no charge. It means it has an equal number of positive and negative charges. As the cathode goes through, he's separating, separating out the negatives. That must mean there must be an equal number of positives. See, if he couldn't separate anything out, we wouldn't know that there was this balance going on. But since he could separate a negative, there must be a corresponding positive that was left behind. That's basically what this whole process did. And so Thompson went ahead and named those negative particles electrons. 
and said, okay, there's a fundamental element, there, excuse me, there's a fundamental particle of all elements known as an electron. And whatever it is, it is a negatively charged particle. Later, one of his students, Rutherford, went through, and we're going to talk about Rutherford's experiment in more detail in a little bit. He went through and said, okay, that corresponding positive thing, I was able to discover that too. So for every negative, there must have been a positive to balance it out to be a, initially be a net neutral. And that positive thing, we're going to call that a proton. That's positive. So electron is negative, proton is positive. And then to confuse it even more, later on, Chadwick comes through in 1932, and he discovers a third subatomic particle known as a neutron. And he said, here's the deal. We are discovered neutrons. Okay, it's a particle that's not an electron, and it's not a proton, and it has a net neutral charge because it's not attracted to fields or electric fields or magnetism. So it's not attracted to the positive, it's not attracted to the negative, but it is equally a component. And so we can't separate it by field, but it's there. So it's one of these three primary subatomic particles, electrons, neutrons, and protons. And all of this, again, is in your text. This is just a quick summary of those main points. So we're going to take a moment now and learn how to determine, and I think, I think it's earth science they were doing this last week, determining the number of protons and electrons in an atom. Pretty straightforward. Okay, for every element, and we're going to use the periodic table quite a bit here. For every element on the periodic table, the element's atomic number is the number of protons. Now when you're considering the makeup of an element, the atom of an element, I want you to understand and I want you to keep this primary. The proton is the master component. The proton count determines what you're looking at. What do I mean by that? Okay. Let's suppose that I have an atom and I look into that atom and I know that it's a sodium atom. It's, it's one atom of the element sodium. It has an atomic number of 11. Okay? That number 11 is the number of protons in the nucleus of that element. Okay. If I get on Frizzle school bus and I go down to the subatomic level and I look into the nucleus and I find 11 protons, I am looking at sodium. If I am able to inject a proton into the nucleus, and take the number of protons from 11 to 12, I'm no longer looking at sodium. I'm now looking at magnesium, okay? The number of protons determines what you're looking at. So if it has 11 in nucleus, it's sodium. If it does not have 11 in nucleus, it is not sodium. Doesn't, if, if I don't change the, the number of neutrons, if I don't change the number of electrons, or excuse me, I can change the number of neutrons and I can change the number of electrons, but if I change the number of protons, I'm looking at something else. I've changed it. And that's why it's such a dramatic thing. We can't easily <laughs> change the number of protons. We can't shift something from being sodium to magnesium on a whim, okay? So in terms of the subatomic particles, if you know how many protons you're looking at in the nucleus, you know what the element is. And conversely, if you know what the element is, you know how many protons have to be in that nucleus. Because if it's some other count, it's not what you think it is. It's something other. So if I were to say, hey, I've got an atom of sodium with 12 protons in the, in the nucleus, you go, stop, it's not sodium. How do you know? Because sodium has 11. If it doesn't have 11, it's not sodium. Good answer. Okay. It had 12. So I was wrong. It's actually magnesium. I've got an atom of magnesium. Okay. What else can you tell me about it? How'd you know it was magnesium? Because it had 12 protons. Proton count is king. Got it? Okay. So for every element, there is a number associated with it on the periodic table, and that, that atomic number is the number of protons. It is also the number of electrons. This is confusing to some students because you do have the possibility of forming ions. Now an ion is an atom that has a charge, a net charge. OK? 
okay? And we've just spoken about this. If I have an atom that has a net charge, whether positive or negative, that means it has an imbalance, right? For it to have a charge, it's got to have more positive than negative or more negative than positive. If it has a perfectly neutral charge, that means the components are perfectly balanced. Are we good with that idea? Okay. When it says that the number of electrons has to equal the number of protons, that is in order to have a net neutral atom. An ion is a non-neutral atom. So in most cases, most of the time, if you have a neutral atom, if I said, okay, go back to my example of sodium. If I have an atom of sodium, but not an ion of sodium, but if I have an atom of sodium, it's going to have 11 protons and it's going to have 11 electrons. Why? I've got 11 positive because 11 protons, that lets me know I've got sodium. To have a net neutral, every positive proton has to have a corresponding negative electron. If I have 11 positive, I need 11 negative to make a zero charge. So every element here, potassium, 19. That 19 tells me I have 19 protons and I also have 19 electrons. If I don't have a perfect match, I now have a net charged particle called an ion. So for a neutral atom, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons and is equal to the atomic number on the periodic table. Any questions on that? Pretty straightforward? You should have heard this before, and this should be kind of familiar. All right. So on your own, 3.1 asks, how many protons and electrons are in the following atoms? It's asking for atoms. It's not asking for ions. So you know right now that the numbers are going to be the same because protons has to equal number of electrons to have a net neutral charged atom. All right, so I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Oh, actually, I will try to pronounce it, but I don't know that I'm right. That's, that's your, go, you should say that one, Molly. Aww. Molybdenum. Yeah. That's your new name, molybdenum. Okay, <laughs> MO. How many protons, which ironically, is the number of electrons, are in one atom of Mo. Well, the first thing we have to do is find Mo on the table, right? Either page 52, front cover, or up front. Do you see it? What number is Mo? Mo is 42, right. And later on, you'll say, OK, this is Mo. It's in column 6B, row 5. So Mo or molybdenum has an atomic number of 42. Therefore, how many protons does Mo have? 42. How many electrons does Mo have? 42. How do you know? Because I read it. <laughs> how do I know they're equal? Because it doesn't have a charge? Because it would tell me ion as opposed to atom? OK. What about beryllium? We've seen beryllium. You've memorized beryllium. Beryllium is column 2A, row 2, atomic number 4. Therefore, beryllium has four protons and four electrons. And lastly, hafnium. Hafnium, when you've Finally find it, it's over here, row 4B, or column 4B, row 6. Atomic number is 72. Therefore, it has how many protons? 72, and how many electrons? 72. You just read it right off the chart. The number, the, the, the atomic number is the number of protons and is also the number of electrons in the net neutral atom. All right, now we get to the fun part, the number of neutrons. On a discussion of, of neutrons and this idea of isotopes, one of the things for terminology wise I want you to get straight is that a lot of people get this idea that there is a standard form for every element and then there are isotopes of that standard form. When we talk about what an isotope is, and we'll explain it in just a moment, but what, what, what I want you to realize is there's not one base and everything else is an isotope. Every form of the element is an isotope of each other. 
I think in the book they say it's not so much about the count, it's about a relationship. It's like isotopes is a way to say they're all cousins. So who's, who's the real cousin? Well, they're all cousins, they're all real. They're all valued, mom loves them all, aunt loves them all, whatever, right? They're all cousins, they're just a little bit different, but they're all family. That's what isotope communicates. There's no one that's the standard. Now there is gonna be one that is the most prevalent, the most common, but it doesn't mean it's the only legitimate one. So hopefully that'll help you as we go into this discussion. What is an isotope? They're atoms with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. So what are we saying? Let's go back to sodium again, 11, okay? Sodium has 11 protons all the time. If it doesn't have 11, it's not sodium. So if I say we've got an atom of sodium, boom, 11. Is it net neutral? Yes, 11 electrons. Now what? How many neutrons? Well, how do we come up with this number? We're gonna look at three types of carbon, three isotopes of carbon. There's carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. The first one, carbon 12. It's either gonna be written with a carbon Actually, this should be carbon, not C12, but for space, I wrote it C12. Technically, I would expect that you would write carbon-12. So it's either gonna be carbon-12 or superscript 12C. Now, if I see a 12 associated with a carbon, and I look over at carbon, and I see its atomic number, and its atomic number is six, right? Carbon has an atomic number of six. In order for it to actually be carbon, how many protons does it have to have? Six. Okay. In order for it to actually be a net neutral atom, how many electrons must it have? Six. So where does a 12 come from? Right. The atomic mass is the combination of the number of protons and neutrons. So if I say I've got carbon 12, and I know that number 12 is the equivalent of the neutrons plus the protons, and six of them have to be protons, then six of them must be neutrons. So for carbon 12, it's six protons and six neutrons. Next is carbon 13. So carbon hyphen 13 or superscript 13 carbon. What does that tell me? Well, first of all, the number of protons has to be six because if it's not six, it's not carbon. It has to be six. And the mass is the, the, the difference between the number given, it's got a mass of 13, I take six away for the number of protons, so it means there's seven neutrons. And lastly, carbon-14 is six protons and eight neutrons. The number of protons has to be the number for that element. That's the number of protons. The number of neutrons can vary. So when you have isotopes, all three of these are isotopes of carbon. There's not one of these which is the true carbon and two of them that are wannabes. They're all truly carbon. Now, the vast majority of carbon that's out there is carbon-12. Like 98% of all carbon is carbon-12. But if you had a handful of carbon right now, and I said, what, what do you have in your hand? And you said, carbon. I'd say, you can do a little better than that. Do you have, do you have carbon-12, carbon-13, or carbon-14? You say, hmm, I don't know. The truth is you would have all of them. When you have carbon, you have a mixture of carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. On average, I, the vast majority of them are gonna be carbon-12s. So if we could go down and separate them out based upon their mass, the vast majority would have six protons and six neutrons, but there would be some others left over. And some of those would be carbon-13, which means they've got one additional neutron from the stand, from not, again, not the standard, but from the most uh, prolific or the most present and then some carbon 14s too, a small number of carbon 14s, which have eight neutrons. They're all equally carbon, because here's the deal. For isotopes, in chemistry, they behave identically in their chemistry. We're gonna find out later on that the thing that determines how something acts and reacts in chemistry is the number of electrons it has in its valence shell, okay? Again, don't worry about the terminology, but it's based upon electrons. The number of electrons is based upon matching the number of protons. And every one of those carbons has the same number of protons. So every one of them is gonna have the same number of electrons, and so they're all gonna react chemically identically. But the biggest difference is their mass. 
and their mass is different because of the number of neutrons that they have in the nucleus. Now this becomes uh, quite significant later on. Um, we talk about enrichment. We'll do that maybe tomorrow. But again, the mass number is the number of protons and the number of neutrons. And in your book, this is an example of what that looks like. Let's say this is helium. Generally, there are two numbers associated with every element on every periodic table. There could be more information, but there's generally at least these three pieces of information. The, the symbol, its atomic number, which is the number of protons, also the number of electrons in a neutral atom, and a number which is larger, which is not a nice integer. Okay. Let's get real technical if you're here for a minute. If you follow the formula, if you're one of those formula people, say, okay, helium 4003. How many, how many protons are in that element? Two. Good. So how many electrons are in this element, an atom of this element? Two. How many neutrons are in the element? Some would say 2.003 neutrons. Here's the deal. You either have a neutron or you don't. You can't have a part of a neutron. So how do they come up with the number 4.003? The atomic mass is a weighted average. Just like with carbon. I said the vast majority are carbon 12s. Now there are some carbon 13s and some carbon 14s. But for the vast majority, it's carbon 12. If you look at carbon, its mass over here on this periodic table is 12.0111. What that tells me is if I take the average mass of all known carbon atoms, the average is not going to be a perfect number, is it? But the average is going to be 12.011111. Okay, what that tells me is I can, I can pretty much assume that every carbon is going to have, on average, an atomic mass of 12. And from that, six protons and six neutrons. See? This is an average, a weighted average. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a bazillion of one and a couple of another. That doesn't mean a couple of the other don't exist, but the vast majority are going to be, it's going to drive that number to be that number. This tells me here that the vast majority of helium has two protons and two neutrons. Incredibly vast number. Now, there's a few in there that have an extra neutron. That's why this three thousandths shows up. You know, maybe three out of every thousand has three. But the vast majority have two. And when they have two neutrons and they already have two protons, the vast majority are pushing that number towards an average mass of four. So again, when, you, when you're using the periodic table, that's why a lot of times they simplify the number for you. I think in our book here, let's see, I'm going back to page 52, they round it to the tenths place. Okay. But realize that no element, no atom of those elements has exactly that number because that number is a partial number, whereas every atom has a perfectly whole number. So it's going to be either, in this case, the vast number, the vast majority are going to have two neutrons, a few might have three, or some other combination, but the vast majority are going to have two. All right. I'm glad you're wowing. Okay. So on your own, three, two. What are the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons that make up the following atoms? Neon 22. How am I going to go about figuring that out? I have an atom of neon, and I accurately name it as neon 22. What does the 22 tell me? Someone, what does the number 22 mean? No, because in order for it to be neon, let's find it on the periodic table. Neon is over here. What's the atomic number of neon? 10. In order for it to be neon, it has to have 10 protons. If it doesn't have 10 protons, then this isn't true. So what must that number, since that's not the number of protons, 
and therefore it cannot be the number of electrons, what must the 22 indicate? Not its atomic number, but its atomic mass. Okay, so I've got neon with an atomic mass of 22. I have to know its mass in order to figure out how many neutrons it has. I don't need anything to figure out how many protons it has because it's neon, and neon always has 10. It has to have 10, otherwise it's not neon. And if it has 10, it is neon. Therefore, how many protons are in neon 22? I don't even need to know that. How many protons are in neon? 10. How many electrons are in neon? 10. How many protons and electrons are in neon 22? 10. So all I have left to figure out is how many neutrons. And if this is my atomic mass, my number of neutrons must be correct, 12 because 22 minus 10 is 12. If the protons plus the neutrons is equal to 22, and the protons is 10, then 22 minus 10 is 12. So therefore, neon 22 has 10 protons, 10 electrons, and 12 neutrons. What is the average mass? Well, this chart says it's 20.179. The average is 20. So I have right here an atom of neon which has slightly more neutrons than the average. Is it still neon? Yeah. Because an atom can take on neutrons, it doesn't change it chemically. It doesn't change its identity because it's not changing the number of protons. It doesn't change its charge because neutrons are neutrally charged. It's changing its mass, but in the big scheme of things, that is probably the least consequential to the way it behaves, if at all in chemistry, because chemistry is based upon electrical charges, okay? Second one, fluorine 19. Okay, start by not even caring about the number. What, are we, what, what is the element we're looking at? Fluorine, some variant of fluorine. Fluorine over on the periodic table. Column 7A, atomic number is nine. Or excuse me, yeah, nine. If the atomic number is nine, how many protons does it have? Nine, how many electrons? Nine. Now, how many neutrons? If I have atomic number of 19, or excuse me, atomic number of nine and atomic mass of 19, the difference is 10, right? Okay, 19 minus nine is 10. So this atom of fluorine is fluorine because it has, it has to have nine protons. And it has to be neutrally charged, which means it has to have nine electrons. But because it has a mass of 19, the 19 minus nine leaves me 10. Therefore, there are 10 neutrons in that atom of fluorine 19. Last one, try to do it on your own. Uranium 235, okay? Uranium is way down here. I'll point it out to you. So since I pointed it out, you can quickly tell me uranium has how many protons? 92, how many electrons? 92, now figure out how many neutrons. So we know protons and electrons, how many neutrons? Just keep the number to yourself for a minute. We'll give everybody a chance to do the pencil, pencil drill. Does everybody have pretty close to anyway? Give it just a few moments. Okay, so uranium-235 is 92 protons, 92 electrons, and how many? 143 neutrons, correct. Okay, how do you know it's 143? Because it has to have 92 protons to be uranium, and it has an atomic mass of 235. So 235 minus the 92 gives us 143. Now on your own, 3-3. Three, three. An atom has 33 protons. Stop! What is it? You don't need any more information. They told you it has 33 protons. Therefore, it is what? We can go 19, 20, 33. Arsenic. 
It'll kill you. Okay? It's all natural. How many people here think all natural means healthy? Arsenic is all natural. It'll kill you. <laughs> okay? So all natural means you'll die naturally. Um, arsenic. Okay. It's got to be arsenic because it has 33 protons. It's not an ion. It's a neutral atom because it has 33 electrons. Now the little bit of information is 41 neutrons. What is its full name and symbol? Arsenic 74. It can be written as 74 arsenic or arsenic number 74. Remember, the 74 is the atomic mass. The atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. 33 and 41 is 74. It's arsenic because it has 33 protons. It's arsenic 74 because it has 41 neutrons to go with those 33 protons. 